Let's talk about AlexNet. AlexNet is named after Alex Krzyzewski and this network was proposed in 2012. If you look at it, it looks extremely similar to Linnet. As a matter of fact, when this network came out first, people didn't quite appreciate what was in there. After all, you know, this was like Linnet, but just a lot bigger, more convolutions, more layers, and yep, just that. Um, so this only changed when the AlexNet model won the ImageNet competition considerably. It's only then that people realize that maybe something exciting is going on there. So let's dive into it in a bit more detail. Uh, let's take a step back in history, namely to 2001, around that time. So kernels ruled the roost and in fact you could just go and design a nonlinear function class by extracting features. You would pick your kernel for similarity. You'd solve a convex optimization problem and then, you know, you'd go and prove a theorem or two and you'd prove that things are optimal, consistent and so on and life was good. The same thing was true in computer vision. You'd go and maybe design a non-convex optimization problem. You'd use a fair amount of math to describe how a specific geometric problem would map nicely into a corresponding computer vision problem and then you know you solve the math and whenever reality mapped nicely into your mathematical approach things was life was good it would work and again you'd get lots of beautiful theorems and whenever you managed to solve a problem in a convex manner this was a hallmark paper so that's computer vision now the see the underbelly of computer vision around the time was feature engineering and some people would have probably argued that most of the interesting parts in computer vision were how to design new features. In fact, if you designed like a SIFT or a SURF feature extractor, you pretty much had it made, as in this could get you tenure. And well, what you would do then is you would take your images, extract relevant feature points, then maybe you'd go and cluster and arrange them properly. And then in the end, you know, you solve that by applying your support vector machine and life was good. So feature engineering was quite crucial, but it also limited the amount of engineering throughput that you could do because for every new problem, you had to do additional feature engineering. Now, this sounds not very enlightened if we look back, but there's a simple reason why people at the time would design models in this way. So let's look at the progression of data, memory and compute that was available in different decades. And I've just rounded it to the next power of 10, just because we really care about orders of magnitude. So data set sizes didn't really start growing a lot until around 2000, maybe 2010, with the internet, cloud computing and so on becoming available, where basically it was now possible to store data from a lot of users, a lot of interactions, a lot of instances, and this is why the amount of data jumped from 2000 to 2010 by a factor of 100 and then from 2010 to 2020 by a factor of 1000. Now, <clears throat> in terms of memory, well, things didn't improve a lot, but in terms of compute, we had a breakthrough probably around 2010 when people switched from single or small numbers of cores to massively multi-core architectures like GPUs. So before that, you know, dual core, maybe quad core architectures were kind of the standard of what you would have on your desktop. And only now, you know, you're starting to be able to buy, you know, 16, 32 core machines at reasonable prices. Or of course, if you go to the cloud, you get up to 100 cores. But still, if you go and use a GPU, you might get, you know, thousands. This led to correspondingly much higher performance compute. For instance, on a P3 server, you might have eight voltas, and that gives you, you know, over a petaflop of compute. Now, correspondingly, deep networks were popular around 1990 when compute was 
well, there was some there, but memory was tiny and the data sets weren't that big. So that's when deep networks were really good at inference time. So then around 2000 up to 2010, kernel methods were the right thing to use because the data sets weren't too big yet. And you could store non-trivial parts of the kernel matrix in memory. Remember, a kernel method requires a kernel matrix, and that tends to go super linearly in the amount of data that you have. And so as long as you have enough memory and compute isn't so much of an issue, things are good. What happened then is that compute took a quantum leap forward. So mind you, the first successful modern implementation of deep networks happened on GPUs with AlexNet, so that was 2012. And so it's very clear that only once compute was available, it was a practically feasible option to switch to non-linear, non-convex, highly compute intensive settings. And that's exactly deep networks. Now, let's look at the data. So ImageNet came out in 2010, and it was a big data set at the time. 1.2 million examples, 1,000 classes. So compare that to 60,000 observations, 10 classes for uh, yeah, MNIST. Also, the resolution was considerably bigger by maybe a factor of 1,000. So it went from 28 by 28 to 469 by 384 dimensions. And the images were in three channels, namely red, green, and blue, whereas before that we had grayscale. So that changed things a lot. Now, until 2012, around that time when AlexNet won the ImageNet competition, the default strategy for solving computer vision problem was to go and pick manually engineered features. You would then go and apply an SVM in the end. And this was replaced by features that were learned automatically, followed by a softmax. But AlexNet wasn't just a bigger and badder Lynette. There were a number of other key changes. One was dropout regularization, which allowed people to design much deeper networks. As you move to deeper networks, of course, just regularizing with regard to the input doesn't help so much. You need to also regularize the inner structure of the network. So this is essentially taken off regularization applied to all the layers of the network, or at least in multiple places whenever you use dropout. Whereas otherwise, you would just smooth things with regard to the input. The second thing was ReLU, so rectified linear units. In other words, you replace the sigmoid nonlinearity by just the max between x and 0, which had as a consequence that the gradient would no longer vanish because you had at least one half space where the function was the identity. The last thing was max pooling, which replaced <coughs> average pooling. And then the result of that was that now features were rather a bit more shift invariant because you could now you know, move your attributes a little bit and max pooling would still pull the relevant attributes through. So this led to a paradigm shift in computer vision. And after computer vision, well, that's then when people went to speech recognition, natural language processing, uh, text generation, a lot of other things that Deep networks afterwards proved their metal. But it started with computer vision. So let's look at the architecture. So in AlexNet, you can already see that already the intake is quite different. So the images are much larger, I mean, than 32 by 32 pixels, which are just 28 by 28 padded with zeros on the outside. You had 228 by 220, sorry, 224 by 224 with RGMB, red, green, and blue as the channels. This was followed by convolutions with a vastly larger number of channels, 96 versus 6. And then, of course, you know the pooling operations. <clears throat> so if you look at the bulk of the network, again, you have a lot more channels, so 256 versus 16. So that's 16 as many. And then you have a lot more convolutions later on. So those convolutions ensured that you have a much more expressive degree of nonlinearity as you move through the network. And this, of course, allows you to recognize a lot more classes. 
to look at the end of the network, well, you're dealing with 4096 as opposed to 120 hidden units. And those nonlinearities were necessary in order to have enough information for like a thousand output classes as opposed to 10. So you might wonder why did they pick 4096 as opposed to maybe 8000 or maybe 3000. Well, the idea was, I suppose, that if you have a thousand classes in the end, you need more than a thousand dimensions to describe them well. And the upper natural limit was also the size of the GPUs. So remember, AlexNet had to be actually split between two GPUs initially because there wasn't enough space in terms of memory on a single GPU. And a lot of the engineering in order to make AlexNet work at the time was to write code which would synchronize those two GPUs. Now, there were a few more tricks. So one thing, the most important thing really was data augmentation. So let's have a look at the picture of this cat lying on its back. Okay, cute cat, and if we crop out a part of it, we'll still be able to recognize this as a cat, at least humans would. So the idea was that rather than training on the original images, you would train on those cropped parts, which then can be used to infer you know, what the class is. The other thing is to have transformations in terms of brightness, color space, and so on. All those things improve the robustness to changes that you might have between training and test images. Now, to wrap this up a little bit, if you look at the complexity of such networks, well, AlexNet is a lot more complex. In terms of computation, well, it's 250 times more expensive. In terms of parameters, only 10 times more. And this was another key change, that the trade-off between computation and memory changed quite a bit. And AlexNet is actually known for being rather extreme in terms of its memory usage. So nowadays, that ratio would have been probably even much more skewed towards compute, because compute devices have become a lot faster, and therefore people like to exploit that. So that's the trade-off that's actually happening right now, because memory scales with the amount of silicon, compute still scales with the amount of compute units that you have, and if you have more dumb units, then you can go from single core to multi-core, which is what you have on GPUs, to, for instance, systolic arrays, which you by now have on custom chips like TPUs. So this explains a little bit how we got from Lunet to AlexNet, which is the considerably more complex version of a convolutional neural network. What we'll see in the following is how to make those networks work even better, get high accuracy, and how to address some of the problems created by just scaling up Lunet.